Coffee, Cows, and Crops is produced by the Peace Country Beef and Forage Association and hosted by Extension Coordinator Johanna Murray. On this podcast, we discuss management practices and research results with scientists, ranchers, researchers, and farmers. We strive to share innovative information and farming practices supported by sound science and practical wisdom. So grab a cup of coffee and let's get learning. All right. Hi, everybody. Thanks for tuning in to today's episode of Coffee, Cows, and Crops. Uh, In this episode, I'm chatting with Ryan Hicks, uh, the Peace Country Board representative uh, from the Alberta Beekeepers Commission. And we're talking about managing honeybees in the Peace Country. But before we get into all that fun stuff, Ryan, would you mind introducing yourself and talking a little bit about how you got started with bees? Sure. Okay. Well, thanks. Uh, First of all, thanks for having me. Um, it's always fun talking bees. Uh, many people don't know that, but uh, <laughs> we uh, run an operation just outside of McLennan uh, in the Peace Country, um, and I'm partners with my father and my brother. Um, so I grew up with it, and um, and now my boys are just kind of getting to the age where they're going to start to help in the summers. So it's it's been a lot of fun. Awesome. So to start us off, can you tell me a bit about the basics of beekeeping? Well, the the biggest thing is um, trying to keep these insects alive through the winter. Of course, that's what we're battling right now. So um, there's the kind of the flow of it is, is you you wrap them and get them ready for um, winter. And then they're kind of dormant or as you'd hope they'd be as dormant as they possibly could be through winter while staying alive. Um, and then you start the bee build up uh, into May when, or April when the willows start to bloom and, and um, get them as strong as you can before the big flowers arrive in the canola fields in July. Cool. And just because I'm curious, do you, where do you keep them over the winter? Well, there's different ways of doing it. Um, so in our operation, because we've got three partners, it's it's worked out well um, to transport them down to the Okanagan and Similkameen Valleys in BC. So that's where the bulk of our bees are right now. Um, we we take them in October and and then we'll bring them back to the Peace Country in um, May. And um, we do that just so the winters are a little bit milder um, on them and. Um, we can get an earlier start and, and hopefully make make up all our winter losses before they get back here in May. Mm-hmm. Whereas if it, uh, other guys will, will wrap them um, in insulation and leave them in the fields where they are, or, or preferably in a uh, isolated spot where the wind isn't getting them, or you can can move them into a, a building with airflow and and. Uh, keep the temperature right around zero degrees Celsius. Okay, that makes sense. So obviously I'm not a beekeeper. <laughs> um, I, and I think most of my familiarity with like beekeeping is seeing the, the bee boxes along the edges of fields and stuff. So I know beekeepers might work with farmers or ranchers to help pollinate crops and you have, and you might work with somebody to, to keep boxes at their field. Um, But what sort of stuff might guide your decisions when you're placing those bee boxes? Well, first and foremost, I guess, is that the the bees have to be able to sustain themselves. And um, and for our purposes, we're trying to make extra honey. So we're looking for um, a a really good floral source, a canola field, alfalfa, clover. Um, And secondly, we're looking for... um, a spot that's kind of sheltered and and preferably out of the way like we our industry relies on um landowners allowing us to put be our bees on their land it's beneficial for them but um we still don't want them tripping over nobody likes to trip over a beehive so if we (laughs) get them out of the way so that um they're helping out the fields um without being in the way that's kind of what we'd prefer Mm -hmm. that makes sense uh, speaking of extra honey, how often do you go out to to collect the honey? We do it. Um, we'll, we'll hopefully on a good year you get three good pulls. 
of honey three different times you'd go around to the same hive and get it um and we we typically would start about well between july 10th and and july 15th on a normal year and um usually it's every two weeks or so you'd, you'd like to be around our, our season is really compressed for for harvest um as long as there's flowers out there that's kind of when they're making honey so um typically canola starts to kind of fade away like august 10th the flowers are starting to to fall off the the uh, plants um mm -hmm. so we got about six weeks where it's it's really intense and we try to get around three times okay so as a beekeeper you probably get this sort of question a lot but i know like in dairy cattle and chickens what they eat can t affect the taste of like the eggs or the milk um is it similar for honey like would bees with access to predominantly say an alfalfa or a clover field have a different tasting or a different color of honey than bees that are predominantly in canola or other field crops yeah yeah no it's kind of the same concept like um different flowers are going to taste differently our, our first major honey flow and actually we don't we don't extract the honey because there's a bit of a dearth after um before the canola blooms is dandelions and and um that honey is as bitter as as you'd imagine it would be ever hmm. well the dandelion um so it, it's really good for the bees but i i wouldn't put dandelion honey on my toast um and then clover and alfalfa's kind of got a whiter white like a real white appearance to it when it granulates and and uh, canola's kind of in that ballpark too okay we had one field that was um we we do a little bit of pollination in southern alberta and and one of the fields that was beside a canola field was dill and that is a very dark and and uh, pungent honey um, that I ever experienced before. Huh. So that was kind of interesting. Yeah, that's really neat. So aside from, I guess, flavor of the honey and that sort of stuff, there's like there's some common metrics for livestock producers, like number of calves and weaning weight or pounds of milk produced, that sort of stuff. Uh, do you have metrics that you measure with your bees? Do you judge, do you compare hives and that sort of stuff? How, how does that work? Yeah, yeah, and it's kind of the same thing. It's based off uh, production. Um, and so you you kind of, you can kind of tell what kind of production you're going to get with how the hive is built up. Um, so the queen is the most important bee in the in the whole hive and if she's healthy then you're going to get a good build up through spring and um we we like to think that we could average 150 pounds a, a hive uh, those are probably older numbers um now the farming practices are so good uh, a lot of the seed goes into the ground in in uh 10 days or two weeks, whereas before it might have taken a month to get all the seeding done, um, which of course mm -hmm. spreads out the flowers for us. So um, we we base our our metrics on um, how many pounds of honey they make. And um, that's kind of really the only thing. That makes sense. So I know like the Beaver Lodge Research Station does a bunch of work on uh, bee pathology in cooperation with GPRC. Um, but I imagine it's a little trickier to hold down a bee for like vaccination <laughs> than it would be for a cow. So how do you control disease in a, in a beehive? Yeah, there's not a lot of vaccinating going on, I'll tell you that. Um, but, <laughs> but we do have to keep their health up. And for the most part, um, a lot of their medication goes into the feed. Uh, which is um, like six parts sugar and four parts water. It's sugar syrup. Um, and so we can put our, a mm. lot of our medications go into that for gut disease um, and um, taking care of different spores. But our major, major problem with bees is uh, the varroa mite. And that is in, we actually use a, a tiny amount of um, pesticide 
to um, kill them. And it's in a little plastic strip that you put in the hive and, and uh, you keep it in the hive for just over a month. And, and if you don't, well, th there's different ways of doing it. There's organics uh, too, where you we're using oxalic or there's a couple different acids to kill the, the uh, mites, but they're, they can be a little bit variable in how effective they are. And uh, then it, the mites get out of control, then other diseases creep in and uh, that can be a real problem for us. Right, that makes sense. Um, are there things you would watch for to see if there is disease like happening or if there are other warning signs when you're see, starting to see lots of mites or anything like that? Yeah, yeah, so the mites feed off the larva. Um, so they get, they get into, the bees at a very young age and they can they when they get into the larva they can affect the way the bee is developing and so the uh, well by the time you see it you've got a problem that you're you've got to address right away and and one of them is mm -hmm. um, deformed wings so if the bees have wings that are kind of tattered um, or or don't look right then you know you've got a mite disease uh, other other telltale signs are spotty brood for different diseases. If like when when the queen is laying in a honey frame, like in the honeycomb, that's where she's laying her eggs. And if she's missing a bunch of different cells, um, it's usually a pretty good indication that there's something wrong, either with the queen herself. If maybe she's old, the queens typically last two years. I mean, they can last three or four but that's not kind of the standard. Um, so you, you start to see things that don't look quite right in the hive and it's time just to figure out what's going on. Mm -hmm. So in your operation, um, is there something that you're especially proud of? Uh, um, <laughs> that's, a, that's a tough one. Yeah, I, I, I guess, um, well, I'm proud first, I guess, to work with um, my family members. Um, that, that's often rewarding. I mean, it's uh, not without its um, squabbles every once in a while, but um, at the end of the day, uh, working with families is, is pretty rewarding. And, and we've kind of grown our operation as, as myself and my, it's, he's actually my twin brother. Um, and we got in at the same time. So we've, we've grown our operation and diversified now so that we do some um, pollination and um, we, we do sell excess bees um, as we can. So we're not quite as reliant as um, purely on honey production, but so those are, those are kind of the mm -hmm. things that I guess um, are, are things that we might be proud of. <laughs> Diversification is always good. Yeah. Um, and what's the, what's the number one thing you wish more people knew about beekeeping? Um, <laughs> I guess just how hard it is. Like there's so many different variables that go into, um, into it to get a successful hive that's productive in the, in the end. Um, Mm -hmm. The weather, the um, where we can get access to bees, like right right now, if if we went to try and buy bulk bees, we'd have to get them from New Zealand or Australia. Like that's a long flight for those insects to be on, um, and then you, and then mm -hmm. they come in one pound packages, and um, it's it's not that easy to build them up. We we don't have a ton of experience bringing bees in because that's that's kind of why we go to BC. But um, to get a hive through the winter is is not that easy. And then to get it to build up properly so that you can make a, a good crop is is uh, tough as well. So I I guess I don't know that the public knows exactly how hard it is to uh, get these insects to be. Um, rare and to go when when we need them to mm -hmm. 
I, I can imagine it. We're always excited that the winter kills the mosquitoes and stuff. It stands to reason it'd be pretty hard on the other insects too. Yeah, it's a bit of a fine line. We do need that cold weather does keep pests away, but. <laughs> yeah, no, that makes yeah. sense. Um, oh, I had another question. We mentioned that you mentioned that queens don't last super long. They're, they're kind of two to four years. Um, how, how do you replace a queen? <laughs> well, the, you can do it yourself um, or you can, you can um, buy them. And we, we get a lot of our queens from um, Hawaii and, and California and mm -hmm. Chile is also another supplier um, because then you can, you, you, you put the queen in and in, in four days she's starting to lay if you were to um get the hive to build to raise its own queen it takes 11 days for the queen to hatch like once the egg is laid um then the, the bees will feed it royal jelly and and um fertilize it and then the queen hatches in 11 days and then it takes another um up to 18 days to um, for that queen to start laying and get mated properly. She's queen. Queens are mated mm -hmm. the first two weeks of their life, and after that, their their window is closed. So they they can either um, get have good mating weather and get out there and and mated. Um, the more they're mated, the better it is. Um, so you you're essentially losing a month, I guess, is what. I'm trying to say um, it, to raise it yourself. So often people are, are getting right. queens going for the next year because they're not, they, they'll make some honey, but it won't be a, a really productive crop the first year. Um, mm -hmm. But it's, you know, that if you do it yourself, you know what kind of queen you're getting. And you're, you're often selecting for um, things like good honey, a high like good honey genetics um if they come through the winter and the hive looks good you you might want to graft from that hive and, and produce more queens from it so so there is benefits in doing mm -hmm. it yourself um as well as the time constraints that come with it similar to raising your own bulls or something like that <laughs> it's time and money but you know what you're getting yeah yeah, exactly. You're picking the, the strong genetics that will uh, be productive for you down the line. Awesome. So to switch gears a little bit, um, we've talked a lot about bee production and stuff. Um, I mentioned at the start that you're a board member for Alberta Beekeepers. Can you tell me a bit about the commission and the work that they do in the province? Yeah, yeah. So I guess in the last few years, our role has changed a little bit in that um the province no longer wants to do research on their own um so the but they they do have lots of grants that are out there for researchers so our our the board is kind of a liaison um for researchers to get some grant money um and then for producers to interact with government if there's new policies or, or uh, anything coming down the pipe, then the board shares that with uh, with beekeepers. Um, we do have a, a monthly publication called the Bee News that um, goes out to keep everybody kind of up to date on on uh, what's going on. And uh, mm -hmm. and then if uh, any producer has any questions, they can come to the board members and. Um, if we don't know the answer ourselves, we, we definitely know where to go to, to uh, try and find the answers. So, so it, it's, right. it's pretty rewarding actually being a board member, just to kind of stay informed and um, to know where the industry is going. Uh, it, so it, I think it's, I'd encourage other members to, to uh, get involved <laughs> or beekeepers. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Yes, always participate in your local commissions and boards and stuff. There you go. <laughs> it's important. <laughs> We're run by a board of directors too, so. Okay, yeah. 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 All right. Um, is there anything else, any fun facts or anything you'd like to mention? Uh, well, I guess I'll, I'll uh, brag about 
how important Alberta is to the Canadian beekeeping um, landscape. Like, so Alberta's got just about half, just under half the hives in Canada are, are uh, in Alberta. So that uh, it, we're a wow. fairly major player and we, we can do that because of, of uh, the different farms that we've got out here and the, the cooperation that is shown towards us. So I think that if other provinces were able to emulate Alberta's uh, success in beekeeping, it, it would be beneficial to them in the long run but that's really cool yeah i would not have i would not have guessed that. Uh, no all those canola fields are, are uh, good for those little critters yeah yeah I, I would have i would have guessed it'd be somewhere like bc or like even ontario with more vegetable farming and fruit production but there we go <laughs> yeah there, there is some um there, there are some and there's actually there's definitely probably more beekeepers in those two provinces specifically but a lot of them are are kind of um more hobbyists where they might have one or two or three hives in their mm -hmm. backyard um but there's not the kind of the commercial scale operations that um uh, alberta saskatchewan and manitoba are, are kind of the bigger prairie provinces yeah. so um, there's lots of blueberries in uh, on the east coast in uh, New Brunswick and Nova Scotia and in northern Quebec, and then blueberries on the west coast as well. But these yellow fields are are glorious, and they they allow us to to uh, run a few more hives over here. Awesome! All right. So if anyone's listening and is inspired to learn more about bees and beekeeping and honey production or any of that sort of stuff. Are there any resources or websites that you recommend? Um, yeah, there's a few different ones. Um, the Alberta beekeepers have their own website and that's Alberta beekeepers.org, I believe. Um, and then there's a scientific um, beekeeping that I follow closely and he's kind of got some innovative ideas and um, on how to handle mites and, and always kind of got some different little projects on the go. Um, and that's scientificbeekeeping.com. So those are the kind of okay. I'd recommend. Awesome. I will put the links to those down in the description. Okay. <laughs> so people can, people can check sure. them out. Well, thank you very much for, for coming on. Okay, no problem. It's always a pleasure talking bees. Peace Country Beef and Forage Association is a research and extension group based out of Fairview, Alberta. Our mission is to help producers thrive in an agricultural system that is profitable, regenerative, and attractive to future generations. To learn more about what we do and see the results of our research trials or our archive of newsletters and fact sheets, check out our website at peacecountrybeef.ca. Want to get in touch? Have a burning question or a topic suggestion? Send us a message on Twitter, Instagram, or Facebook. Thanks for listening. Thank you.